Good morning and welcome to this Adventures in Ideas seminar, which is our first ever hybrid weekend seminar at Carolina Public Humanities. This means that we have a small group of wonderful looking people in the room with us. and We're so thrilled to see that there are still human beings in our community of uh, humanities. But then we have many more people joining us on Zoom, so we are, we are experimenting with a new format. Uh, we're still trying to find our way forward as we gradually emerge from the pandemic. But we want to thank all of you for joining us, no matter what format you're joining us in. And we're very happy to have a live audience uh, with us in the room. Today's seminar is entitled Conceptions of Time, From the Big Bang to Daylight Savings. And we plan to discuss the ways in which the meaning of time has evolved in different historical contexts, and different cultures, and uh, we want to understand that time is a dynamic entity, a concept, not simply a reality. I'm Lloyd Kramer. I'm a professor in the History Department at UNC and also the Director of Carolina Public Humanities. And at this event, I'll also be the speaker for the second session of the seminar. And I'm very pleased that my UNC uh, colleagues, Brandon Bain and from Religious Studies, and Adrian Erickcheck from Physics and Astronomy are joining us for this event today. We're constantly learning about new technology, and this uh, experiment with the hybrid program is just another example, but our goal is always to create conversations about the humanities that help to sustain a community of people who are looking for humanistic perspectives on contemporary issues and on the past. We have uh, more than 70 registered participants at this event, um, and wherever you are, in the United States, in North Carolina, or at the Silver Spot Theater in Chapel Hill, which is where we are today, I want to welcome you uh, and say that you are part of this community. Several of my CPH colleagues are also here with us, including uh, Paul Bonici, who does a fantastic job of managing the technological bells and whistles of all of our CPH webinars and Zoom events. So he's, he's with us today. But I also want to thank Vicki Breeden, who is here to help manage the event, and also Brian Insminger, who is in the uh, organizational team that helped to put this together, and Joanna Smith, who is here in the room and will also be facilitating some of the conversation. But I especially want to thank Susan Landstrom, who is not actually in the room at this moment, but Susan has been a member of the CPH staff since 1985, and she is retiring this week after 36 years of helping to manage something like 960 humanities uh, seminars and many other events beyond that. So this is Susan's last seminar. She was wearing a mask, for those of you who came into the room. She's the masked woman at the front desk. This is, a, after 960 seminars, this is the first one where she had to wear a mask. She received uh, last month the new Warren Nord Award for Distinguished Service to Carolina Public Humanities, but there is no way to adequately thank Susan for all that she has done for Carolina Public Humanities over the last 35 years. And I, I can tell you that uh, the staff is, is definitely going to miss her, but I think all of our participants are going to miss her as well. She's doing a linchpin of our program. So please join me in thanking Susan. Susan is always on the job. She's not actually in the room. You'll have a chance, those of you who are here at Silver Spot, to, to see her a little bit later. So as I've noted, this seminar will focus on conceptions of time. And we're going to begin by discussing some of the religious meanings of time, but then we'll move on to look at how the organization of time categories has evolved in the world, particularly in the modern period, in the industrial era, uh, 
And then uh, how global connections have altered the meaning of time, how Im imperial, Im how empires altered the meaning of time. And then we'll conclude with a discussion of how astronomers conceive of time as we discuss recent interpretations of how the universe began and evolved over the last 13 billion years. We have a wide time frame for this program. Um, so our final session will also be a panel discussion in which all three of our speakers will add additional perspectives and respond to each other as well as to your questions. And of course, people who are watching on Zoom will be able to submit questions through the Q&A function on your Zoom screen there at the bottom. This theme of the meaning of time seemed especially appropriate to all of us at Carolina Public Humanities as we were planning the spring and summer programs because during the pandemic, our usual understanding of time has been transformed. It was hard to keep track of days when we never went out and participated in normal activities. And many people said they were disoriented. And this disorientation helped us to remember that time itself is, is culturally and socially constructed in our lives. So how do people cope with disorientation in their daily activities when their sense of time changes? These were the kinds of questions that led us to this seminar to think about how can the humanities and the sciences help us understand the evolving meaning of time across time, if I may put it that way. So I've noted that uh, for our Zoom participants that we have a group in the audience here at Silver Spot Theater, and I want to thank people here at Silver Spot for their assistance, especially Langston Harris and Jim Russo, who helped uh, us to have access to this room and the technology. And um, they are enabling those of you who are not here to be connected through the miracle of Zoom. And I want to stress to everybody, those who are here in the room and those who are watching on Zoom, that we are planning to resume numerous in-person events for Carolina Public Humanities in the fall. But for now, we're still experimenting with this hybrid model. And this is the first step toward the future. I also want to thank a few other people who are helping to make this possible. I want to thank the Cotton Merca Group at Morgan Stanley for their ongoing support for our programs. I appreciate the generous support of Carolina Meadows, the continuing care retirement community in the Chapel Hill area that supports us, and the uh, General Alumni Association of UNC, which is also one of our partners. The support of these sponsors and partners, as well as the support of many other friends and donors are what have enabled us to continue providing CPH programs throughout the pandemic. And we're now preparing our schedule for the fall and we're going to encourage you to watch your mail and your email for announcements that will be coming in the summer about the fall programs. So most of you have attended CPH programs at one time or another, including those of you who are watching on Zoom. So you know that we've been around a long time, since 1979, in fact. And our programs have evolved a great deal over time. Uh, we're now much more involved in collaborations with public schools, with public school teachers, with community colleges. But our core goals and mission remain the same as they have always been, even while we have moved into new formats, new technologies, and new communities. We always seek to foster dialogues between people within the university with people outside the university, a two-way conversation. And we serve as the intellectual cultural bridge between UNC, especially UNC Chapel Hill, and the whole state of North Carolina and far beyond. I know we have some Zoom participants who are far beyond North Carolina. So I encourage you to visit our website at Carolina Public Humanities to stay informed about our upcoming and current programs. So I also want to welcome a few teachers who are uh, with us today via Zoom, and I want to thank you for the great work you've been doing throughout this pandemic. And I would note that anyone who's a teacher can receive continuing education credit for these seminars. If you're interested in this, you can write to Paul Bonici at Carolina Public Humanities, and Paul can help you get um, the credit for participating in today's event. 
and Paul is also in the room with us here today. Finally, I want to thank the members of our extraordinary advisory board who have continued to provide exceptional service and support throughout the current upheavals. Okay, so I want to briefly summarize now the plan for this hybrid seminar. We're going to have three talks on different aspects of the history of time. Each session will last about 75 minutes, and there will be time for questions at the end of each talk and also in the concluding panel discussion later this afternoon. As I noted, we'll be collecting questions through the Q&A function on the Zoom on your computer. But those of you in the room, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and Joanna will come around and with a microphone help you project your, your comment or your question. So you can ask questions on the Zoom at any time and we will accumulate those questions in, in the Q&A and ask uh, our speakers to respond at the end of their talks. As I've noted, our overall theme will stress the recurring problem of how people describe or use time. So we'll be talking about how people have understood time in different places, in different religions, in different historical eras. And we'll consider how the history of ideas about time continue to affect our culture today. So we also look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions and comments because everyone in this seminar wherever you are, has been affected by the experience of time during this pandemic. So I'm pleased now to introduce our first speaker, Brandon Bain, who is an associate professor of religious studies. There is biographical information about all of our speakers in the packets that those in the room received when they came into the theater. But those of you at home also received biographical information in an email attachment that came to you from Vicki Breeden. Uh, so there's more information, but I want to mention a couple of things. Professor Bain received his BA degree at Columbia University and then went on to receive a Master of Divinity degree at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and a theological doctorate, Doctor of Theology, at Harvard University. He's taught at Fordham University, at Indiana University, and at the Claremont School of Theology. But he joined UNC in 2012, and we're really glad he came. And he has rapidly become a popular and very successful teacher by offering courses on a wide range of subjects in religious studies. And he became especially well known this past year for his careful attention to student needs during the pandemic in the age of Zoom. His research and teaching focus on colonial missions and borderland religions, especially in the southwest of what is now the United States, the southwest border. Uh, he has a particular interest in subjects such as martyrdom, relics, memorialization, and the history of Christianity in Native American communities. And I should stress that he's about to publish an important new book entitled Missions begin with blood, suffering and salvation in the borderlands of New Spain. The book will be published in the coming month by Fordham University Press and it will provide a valuable analysis of how people understand the meaning of martyrdom. Brandon is also interested in how religious communities explain the cycles of time and how time takes on different meanings in different cultural traditions. And these interests provide the foundation for his talk today, which is entitled, Back to the Before Times, Restoration and Return in American Religions. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Brandon to this discussion of changing conceptions of time. Welcome to all of you on Zoom, and welcome to Brandon. And I will now pass the microphone to him. And Susan Landstrom has come into the room, ladies and gentlemen. Elvis is in the room. No, it's Susan Landstrom. One last applause. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to uh, experiment with you all, uh, not just an experimentation in this hybrid technology, but this is the first in-person lecture I've given since February of 2020. So uh, hopefully that will go well and I'll remember how this is done. Um, but we're in a moment, as Lloyd was saying, in which we're all uh, thinking 
of what it means to return to something like the before times. Uh, has anyone heard that term or used it themselves maybe, the before times? It became pretty prominent around May, June, July, and 2020 when we were uh, learning and thinking about all that we had lost, right? Um, thinking about uh, the things that we most enjoy, uh, going out to eat, going to the theater, uh, getting our hair cut, or maybe it's just things that we took for granted, right? Uh, like travel um, and a good meal. And folks began to wonder, could we ever return to the before times? And if so, uh, what would that look like? Now, I'm going to ask you to, to take just a minute and think for yourselves uh, of what you most desired to return to or what you still most hope to return to. I know we're in a moment in which we've begun to do uh, things from the before times <laughs> again, right? Um, if we were in a, sort of a normal situation, I would call this a think-pair-share, where I'd give you a minute to think for yourself and write a couple notes and then maybe pair with someone else and talk about it and then, and then share with us. But we'll, we'll abbreviate that uh, since we are social distancing uh, still and since many folks are at home and, and just ask you to take a minute to think for yourself, to jot down a note or two about what do you most miss or what did you most miss from the before times. Over the course of the last year as we were taking the precautions of uh, staying at home, distancing, not going into public places, what was the thing that you most miss? What do you picture when you think of how things were in February, early March of 2020 before we entered into this, this new sort of time? Now as you do this, uh, you can think for yourself, jot some notes. I'm just going to talk a bit about what uh, a moment that I had last night uh, that reminded me of the before times. Uh, I was here uh, locally here in Carborough, I guess, uh, just close here to Chapel Hill, behind a venue that I have loved to see live music. I'm sure some of you have too, Cat's Cradle in Carborough. Uh, and there was a band playing, uh, Mipso, they're kind of a folk Americana, maybe new, new grass uh, music group composed mostly of UNC graduates, one of whom, the lead singer, actually is a religious studies major. So we have a particular affinity for him, uh, Joseph Terrell. And they, they gave their first concert, a first live concert in the last year behind Cat's Cradle to a group of, I don't know, about 300, 400 of us, uh, where folks were able to kind of come together, uh, even in the rain <laughs> in, the, in the evening last night, and enjoy uh, time together again to listen to a band and just to enjoy a, a, a taste of what things have been like, a normal uh, evening, a normal Friday evening um, in the before times. Has anyone had a chance to imagine something or think of something? Maybe it came quickly for you because it's something you had thought about throughout this last year. Yes, and I'll, I'll repeat uh, your comment. Yeah, I um, had lots of folks I talked to, including my own father, who um, had recently, just weeks before this sort of pandemic set in, been widowed, who, who was alone at home for the last year. Um, and so just that, the simple nature of, of touch, right, um, and hugs, and human proximity. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Any, anyone else have ideas of what they most miss from the before times? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So seeing small grandchildren who live abroad, and it's been near 10 years, or two years, I'm sorry, and, uh, and just not being able to be there with them, as well as the hugs and things like that. Right. So simple things like travel getting in a car and going or, or getting in an airplane, um, all of a sudden uh, seem like, seem so far away, right? And some of us have begun to 
experience that again, but, but it seems so distant, right? Or something that we needed to recover from. Almost, it felt uh, almost immediately like a distant age. It did to me at least, like having to imagine even just months earlier what life was like. Yeah. Right, yeah, I, I, I did that with the second commenter, but I forgot on the first, so I appreciate that. Going to sporting events and playing softball, right? Uh, being able to both watch uh, sports and participate in it. Uh, thank you. Any other comments? Yeah. <laughs> Celebrating holidays, which is, again, I think probably connected to sometimes seeing family or seeing friends, our, our chosen families. So uh, just to repeat what you said, um, you know, the freedom of movement, the ability to just get in a car and go and have that flexibility, but particularly in your case, having a mother uh, who passed away last year and not being able to, to be there. Um, you know, I certainly, as I related, my own mother passed away last year just before, the month before uh, the pandemic. And, and that was something I thought of throughout was the thankfulness Actually, I mean, not for the event, but that it had happened r right before, so I could be there. So I can certainly um, empathize with and imagine how hard that was. So you, I, I, that's the tone that I want to start with, is just uh, evoking for us um, this idea of imagining and thinking about what life was like just months ago, just a year ago, right? Uh, and how different things became so quickly for us. And as Lloyd said, how even time seemed to pass differently, particularly in those first couple months after, uh, after we began to make changes in light of uh, the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, today I want to talk to you about that as a religious imagination. And I want to talk first about that very phrase, the before times. Uh, it's a phrase that it uh, goes back to the 14th century, goes back to the Middle Ages. Uh, in the Middle Ages, people used to talk about before times, almost as synonymous with the word history or bygone days. Uh, before times, we used to do this, right? Uh, it's a phrase that occurs in the King James Bible uh, and talking about an, an earlier time where prophets in the book of Samuel uh, spoke differently than they did during the time in which uh, the, the events of the book of Samuel were being recorded. The before times, prophets used to, or judges used to rule over Israel. Uh, but it's a term that took on new meaning in the 20th century in the United States and English, particularly because of uh, what you see here on the screen, uh, the t television show Star Trek, which in 1966 uh, had a, a particular episode that focused on a planet, a planet called Earth 2, in which it was only populated by children. And it was only populated by children because the grown-ups, the group they called Grups, uh, had all passed away. And they had all passed away because of a pandemic. And the group of children talked about uh, the before time, and meaning the time when the parents were still there, the time before this pandemic had set in, when they imagined themes, things were idyllic and uh, perfect in every way, like a Garden of Eden, right? And in their, their own time, it had been a time of disruption, a time of destruction, a time in which, uh, which things had degraded, a time of degradation. And I, I want to suggest, one of the things I want to suggest today is that when we talk about before times, it usually has this sort of dynamic, a dynamic of an earlier time that was better, that was uh, in some ways perfect uh, and idyllic, in retrospect at least, right, in light of whatever it is we're going through in the present. And we see this recur in other pop cultural phenomena, like Back to the Future, right, in which in that, the first edition of Back to the Future, they're going back to the 50s, right, in a sort of America of the 50s, as imagined by Marty McFly, or, or as he's experiencing it, right, uh, in the film, in which things were simpler, and, and um, things uh, 
weren't as complicated as they were in the 80s. And of course, that was the dynamic I grew up in, at least in the 80s, as a sort of child of the 80s, of the 50s being kind of this imagined, more idyllic time. Now, of course, we know that wasn't the case, right? And I think we're, especially as a university, as we're uh, moving forward and reckoning more thoroughly with the history of UNC, the history of North Carolina, and telling the story more fully about what all North Carolinians experienced uh, in the 1950s, um, that it wasn't all uh, Andy Griffith and Mayberry, right? Uh, that things were difficult for many, many people. And, uh, and that's part of the dynamic. As you're going back to rescue that earlier time, you often, often what was difficult about it can fade, and what you're trying to recover is something positive or pure. Now, I want to set this against uh, what you might think of normally, or what some might think of normally when they think of American religion. Uh, often when I talk to folks about studying American religion or teaching religion in America, uh, the first thing that, that might occur to them, if we were to talk about the, the way time or thinking about time affects religions in America, uh, is often, or what's brought up to me often, is the relationship of evangelicals in the United States to the so-called end times. And particularly as that affects foreign policy, particularly as it affects foreign policy related to Israel. We have uh, just two news stories that I picked up from uh, this year. Uh, and there were there are more news stories even in the last day or two about relationships between evangelicals and their understandings of the so-called end times and how it affects their support for the nation state of Israel. Uh, and we won't go into all of that here, but, but that's a prominent uh, a way in which people think about religion and time in America, and particularly in related to the way that evangelical Christians have imagined a certain future, uh, a future in which, uh, which Christ will return uh, and the, this Messiah will rapture the Christian church, meaning take up the true believers, and the world will go through a time of persecution, a time of destruction and degradation in which... Uh, which uh, the world will have to endure what's called the tribulation before the inauguration of a thousand year reign of Christ. And we see elements of this in uh, all sorts of both popular culture and Christian culture. I have uh, images here from popular culture shows like uh, You, Me, and the Apocalypse, which is a show on NBC, The Leftovers from HBO, as well as uh, sort of more niche, if you're familiar at all with Christian culture, particularly conservative Christian culture, uh, books like Left Behind, popular uh, best-selling New York Times series by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. Before that, the earlier sort of version of Left Behind was a best-selling book in the 70s, early 80s by Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth, as well as uh, Christian music, um, like this song by uh, Larry Norman, Wish We'd All Been Ready, Wish We'd Been Ready for the Rapture, and uh, the show, A Thief in the Night. Not to say as a, as a Evangelical kid growing up and going to a youth group and going to Christian camps. A Thief in the Night was a favorite of the youth pastors uh, when I was growing up in the late 70s, early 80s. I see some folks uh, nodding their heads. It was a way to sort of scare people into the church, right? Because the premise was, uh, at the very beginning, you see this woman wake up in her bed, alarm clock goes off, and, and um, her husband's not there, right? Because he's been raptured. And then the more she goes out into the world, she realize, realizes all, that all true Christians have been taken up and um, the scoundrels have been left behind to figure out how to survive the tribulation. Um, so that's a ways in which that notion of, a, of an orientation towards time in which we are merely awaiting this sort of imminent return of Christ in which uh, Christ will rapture the true church, bring, meaning bringing, catching them up and bringing them into heaven, uh, and then others will be left to negotiate a sort of new orientation towards time, a seven years of tribulation, and then a thousand year reign of Christ on earth, uh, really deeply shapes uh, American religion, but particularly Christianity, and particularly that form of Christianity, uh, evangelical culture. Just to give you one example of this, this is a chart that uh, sets to uh, demonstrate this orientation towards time. Uh, it gives you uh, sort of, it begins on the far left with the present age, I'm sorry. Uh, let's go back one with the present age, uh, with the idea that the church will be raptured, and then an articulation of all the events that will constitute uh, a time of tribulation, 
before a thousand year reign of Christ, a literal 1,000 year reign of Jesus on earth, and then the end or the beginning of the age of ages and the beginning of a new heaven and a new earth which will be eternal. Uh, this is the sort of thing that was it, it's probably impossible to overestimate how prevalent that idea, the idea of so-called premillennial thinking, the idea that we live before a rapture and a thousand year literal reign of Christ, um, shaped Christian churches, particularly more conservative Christian churches in the United States during the 20th century. It's particularly shaped by uh, the distribution of a Bible uh, that had study notes in it, uh, written by a man named C.I. Schofield. Uh, and these study notes articulated this idea, this strong idea that uh, the book of Revelation in particular, but also the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel in the Bible, had given us clues to this future time in which Christ would return and inaugurate a thousand year reign. This, uh, these notes by C.I. Schofield and sort of the system that he set up for thinking about time in a, in a broader sense is often called dispensationalism. And dispensationalism is slightly different but uh, connected to premillennialism and that di premillennialism is, is a, a gesture towards this idea that we live before pre the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ as predicted by uh, the 20th chapter of Revelation according to that interpretation. But dispensationalism is an even sort of bigger idea about how to think about time, particularly how to think about time in terms of Christian revelation. And here a dispensation stands for an age. And dispensationalism asserted that there are seven ages uh, throughout the history of the world, or seven dispensations. And each age uh, had began with an act or a covenant of God uh, or the creator with humanity. That covenant came with stipulations that entailed blessings and curses. To the extent that humanity lived up to those stipulations of the covenant, they were blessed. And to the extent that they uh, backslid or declined, from that they would be judged and found wanting and cursed. And at the culmination of each dispensation, there would be a time of judgment, uh, a sort of ending of that dispensation or an ending of that age, and then an inauguration of a new age. So just here in this particular chart, um, we see the age uh, from the age of Adam, the age of Eden, right, which is uh, judged when the Garden of Eden is sort of closed and Adam and Eve are uh, spun out, and so that's the end of the Edenic dispensation. And then there's a discussion of uh, from the age from Adam to Noah, here called the age of conscience, or the Edemic age. Uh, then the Noahic age, the age from Noah, uh, Noah to Abraham. Uh, the Abrahamic age, from Abraham to Moses. The Mosaic age, from captivity to the time of uh, the arrival of Jesus. And then, I'm sorry, uh, where are we? You can see these are complicated <laughs> to, to fully pull apart. The Davidic age takes place somewhere in here uh, with the arrival of David as king of Israel. And then the inauguration here, really, of the age that we, according to this dispensationalist interpretation, we live in now, which is they're calling here the age of grace or the church age, uh, and that we, we're sort of uh, living between the sort of first coming of Jesus and his death in 33 AD, and uh, this rapture period in which the true church will be brought up to heaven, and uh, then there will be a seven-year age of tribulation before the messianic age, a thousand-year reign of Christ. So that's the dispensationalism then is, you know, the first chart I showed you is really just an unpacking of this last part, right? This, this uh, age we live in into a thousand year reign of Christ, uh, the tribulation and a thousand year reign, and then a sort of age of eternity. But dispensationalism is this wider orientation to history that, that looks backward and says that God has divided things into dispensations or into ages, each one of them coming with a covenant and then blessings and curses. And to the extent that uh, the sort of uh, damnation or degradation or declension piles up, 
then there's ultimately a moment of judgment and an ending of the age. And now this orientation to where we are in the present, of course, means uh, most dispensationalists, premillennialists are going to believe that we are in a time of increasing degradation, increasing declension, uh, and that we need to, we, we are awaiting sort of the culmination of the age of grace or the age of um, the church in which Christ will imminently return, rapture the church, and then begin this process of tribulation going into a thousand year reign of Christ. Now, I've, so, I've tried to simplify something here that you can obviously see for folks who are invested in it. It's enormously complicated, and people who are invested in it would probably correct me to say, well, not everyone believes that the rapture would happen first. That's only the pre-tribulation people. There are post-tribulation people. So it's actually quite uh, variegated and, and more complicated as, we, um, as, as you kind of get into these systems. But I think you get the, the picture. And I just want to pause here because this was a a complicated breakdown of premillennialism and dispensationalism. Are there any points of clarification that I could give before moving forward? So your question is, at what point did people come up with the concept of a year uh, the year as we think about 365 days. I actually don't think that relates to this kind of system, but I, I do think I'm going to anticipate that my colleague uh, Lloyd Kramer is going to maybe be able to address that uh, in, in, in his talk about uh, the way that sort of early modern or Europe uh, began to think about time uh, as we commonly use it today. So the question is, uh, the foundation of these beliefs, where do they come from? How are, where are people basing these beliefs? Um, yeah, it's largely d d derived from a sort of prophetic interpretation of certain books of the Hebrew Bible, the book of Daniel particularly, and the book of Ezekiel as well, and then especially in the Christian New Testament, the book of Revelation. There are some passages in the Gospels as well, particularly Matthew 25, that relate to how, how this is interpreted, but particularly the book of Revelation, and even more particularly the book, the chapter, the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, where it mentions a millennial reign, a thousand year reign. And the, de the debate there is what does that actually mean? Some people say that's symbolic, that just means that's, you know, as most numbers in the book of Revelation are symbolic. Uh, the, the number seven is symbolic for certain things, the number 10 is symbolic for certain things. Uh, the number 666 is symbolic for certain things, right? The numbers are used symbolically throughout the book of Revelation. Some people would say that thousand years is not literal. It just means a t an eternity, right? Uh, or others would say, no, that was actually, that's in reference to the Roman Empire. That happened in the past, right? And have a sort of past orientation to that part of the book of Revelation, that it's primarily speaking about Christian orientation and living within the Roman Empire. But this particular group, and is a particularly strong you know, upwards of 80% of conservative Christians in the U.S. Uh, em have embraced during the 20th century this premillennial idea, and many of them this premillennial dispensational idea of interpreting the book of Revelation, along with it, Daniel and Ezekiel, as predicting something about the future. Now, all that said, I actually want to suggest, as much as I've argued that that's uh, really formative for thinking about religion in America, I want to suggest that the idea of return is just as strong. And it's even there, if you look at that dispensational chart, uh, the idea of looking backwards, right, and understanding what moments in history meant for us is already there uh, in, in those charts. But, but I want to suggest that this idea of, of, of returning to a specific time is just as strong in American religions as this future orientation. So this millennialism, this end times orientation, what's a fancy word for this is eschatology, ideas about what's gonna happen in the future. I think uh, some, a lot of folks know about that or have some sense of that or have encountered it, uh, but there's not as strong of, uh, of a recognition that this impulse towards return and with it, sort of related impulses towards recovering a past, reforming religious experience in light of 
some understanding of the past, revitalizing the present uh, based upon uh, a vision of the past, and restoring a sort of purity or primitive state of the church. I'm going to talk about that term primitive or state of religion to the present is just as strong as the future orientation. A looking backwards, I think, is just as strong as this impulse to look forward. So let's talk about this idea of return. I know uh, my colleague uh, Lloyd Kramer is going to talk, I think, a bit about uh, Mayans and Mayan ideas of time, so I won't spend too much time about this, but uh, I want to just suggest that uh, this is widespread. I'm going to primarily be looking at uh, European-based uh, religious experience in the 18th and 19th century and the, what's now the United States. But if we were to expand beyond that a little bit, think about the Americas more broadly, think about time a bit more broadly, uh, we would see examples amongst a Mesoamerican groups, groups in central, what's now central Mexico down to Central America, including the Yucatan Peninsula, the Olmecs, the Maya, uh, the Mexica, who inhabited uh, what's now the Valley of Mexico, Mexico City, that understood time as, uh, as cycles of return. And so the, we see this in, in calendars, right? We see this in uh, the Maya stelas, uh, which come from Chiapas, Mexico, which uh, tell us that the Mayans had kind of two ways of reckoning time. One was the solar calendar, or the hob, which, which is kind of like, to get back to the question, where do we get the idea of th the year as we consider it. Well, the Maya had that idea. They had an idea of time as measured by 365 days, uh, and, but they didn't divide months the same way we did. They divided them uh, into 18 months of 20 days apiece with a five-day time period that was nameless. And this, you can imagine this is actually kind of a dangerous time, the days that are unnamed or that are extra in uh, the, the solar calendar. But this is primarily based around agriculture, around seasons of planting that repeat over and over. So that notion of, of when are, when's the right season, when's the right time, where the sun will be oriented in a certain way to plant the right thing affected this sort of a need to have a calendar that was based on a 365-day cycle. But they also had a ritual calendar, uh, the Tolkien, which was a 20-day 13-day uh, periods divided, I'm sorry, into 20 segments for 260 days that guided their ritual life, their religious celebration, uh, sacrifice, as well as uh, calendar feast, uh, moments of fasting. And that was more cyclical. That was something that wasn't uh, about moving forward, but was about uh, return and repetition of ritual. The Mexica, more, more popularly known as the Aztecs, uh, inherited and, and borrowed, uh, both from the Maya and other groups like Toltecs and Olmecs, uh, similar notions of two orientations towards time, a solar calendar and a ritual calendar. And probably most famously, if you've, if you've ever been to Mexico City and gone to their anthropology mu museum, you may have encountered uh, this, what's sometimes called the Aztec calendar stone. Uh, which was discovered at the base of the Templo Mayor, the great temple of the Aztecs, which is, was underneath what's now the National Cathedral of Mexico in central Mexico City. Uh, it's probably also a ritual stone. It was at the base of a, of a temple in which humans would be sacrificed, and uh, their, their blood would trickle down the steps to uh, often go into uh, the mouth, the waiting mouth of uh, of, I believe that's Huitzilopochtli, um, what the Aztec sun and uh, hummingbird and eagle uh, god. But this was a, a calendar round. It was a 52-year cycle, and they're all marked out by the different images around the cycle of the 52 years with the idea that time would return every 52 years. Right? It would turn over every 52 years. And there are longer ways of counting this out. The Maya in particular had a long count calendar, which became very famous in 2012, right? as the, the, the Maya long count calendar was turning over in a cycle. And there was some idea that this would inaugurate a sort of apocalyptic moment, but was a failure. It was a way of like reading this calendar round idea that's common in Mesoamerica into a Christian idea of, you know, eschatological end times uh, rather than like a return back to uh, a new inauguration of time. 
My point here is just to suggest that these ideas of return or turning or eternal return, the cycling of time, are common to uh, cultures in the Americas before Europeans arrive. And they function to, as my, my, one of my graduate mentors would argue, David Carrasco, uh, whose book City of Sacrifice talks about how time connects to ritual and sacrifice in Mexico, in uh, Tenochtitlan, the central city of the Mexica, uh, that they function to center the world and to, op and, and to sort of model acts of world renewing. And this is connected to ritual and it's connected to sacrifice, sometimes human sacrifice, of ways of sort of feeding the gods so that agriculture might be renewed via the rain or via the sun uh, and so that they would maintain their prosperity. Now, this is a bit of a, a jump, but at, at the same time as we might talk about the Mexica operating in central Mexico in the 1400s and 1500s, you have movements developing in Europe that are pressing for return, pressing for an idea of, of going back to some earlier time. And I think probably most prominently and maybe most importantly as we think about religion in the United States, uh, this begins to take center stage in the mo movement that we come to call Puritanism. This movement of r Protestants, sort of more radical Protestants in England in the 1500s, late 1500s, who are upset with the compromises of the Church of England. If you're an Episcopalian, you, you, you might know this, this sort of in-between state that the Church of England, and then later the Episcopal Church in the US, has between Catholic practice and Protestant practice. Uh, and the, as that was taking shape in England, and the sort of compromise between Catholic and, and Protestant practice and theology, you have a group of Protestants that are upset by that. And they want to purify the church of what they see as human innovation. And this sense is, this is I think really key to getting where we're going, is that Puritans thought new things were bad. We often think of Puritans, at least in con context of the US, as kind of coming here to help start the new world. But I want to argue that, no, they were coming here to preserve something old. <laughs> As uh, the historian Theodore Dwight Bozeman argues, they hoped to live ancient lives. That they wanted to return to the ancient world somehow, recover the ancient world. And recover it from what? Well, what they called human innovation or human invention. And how did that happen? Well, primarily through Constantine, the Roman emperor, who you know, allows the church first to be protected, tolerated within the Roman Empire, then eventually sponsors. The Roman Empire eventually sponsors the Christian church. And they believe that beginning around the time of Constantine, but something that had begun before Constantine, uh, the church had declined. It had uh, degraded itself. It had moved towards destruction and needed to be purified of these human inventions or human innovations of new things that were added along the way historically. And we needed to sort of leapfrog history we needed to get from, in their case, 1570s back to 33 CE, to this time of the Pentecost, to this time in which you know, Peter and the other apostles are founding the church in the wake of, of Christ's death, that that was the pure time, the first time, the apostolic time, or the primitive time. And here I mean primitive not in the sense of the way anthropologists used to use that to describe certain civilizations that they deem to be lower than other civilizations. I mean, primitive as in this more basic form, the Latin idea primus, right, or primero in Spanish, uh, the first time, the early time, the apostolic time. That's the goal of the Puritans. They want to get back to uh, primitive Christianity. And so they did this by uh, seeking to reform notions of time, and sp specifically in terms of the calendar, they wanted to cleanse the calendar of Popish, what they called popish, it's a derogatory term, of course, but for Catholicism, right? Uh, popish forms, in particular holidays or holy days or feast days. So uh, Puritans did not celebrate Christmas. They did not celebrate Easter. They would have seen that as human invention. They would have seen that as uh, part of something that the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church had added to Christianity along the way. And instead, they emphasize, going back to this question of how do we get this notion of a week, they emphasize uh, the recurrence of the Sabbath, right? And this is an act of primitive restoration. Why? Because they're saying the Bible tells us the only day that is holy is the Sabbath. Now, for them, of course, they had pivoted a bit uh, 
to the Sabbath being Sunday, not Saturday, and uh, justifying that by thinking of it as the day of resurrection or the Lord's day. But that was the only one and only day that was marked out as sacred in a Puritan calendar, was the Sabbath day, in which you would cease from work, you would spend your day mostly you know, traveling from your farm to wherever the church was, you'd listen to a sermon for three hours in the morning and then go and um, contrary to mythology, Puritans were pretty heavy drinkers, uh, <laughs> so they might go and drink some cider uh, in the horse shed uh, as one of my advisors, David Hall, sort of famously uh, talks about them, the horse shed Christians, uh, Puritans that would listen to sermons all day and then drink and talk business in the horse shed uh, in between that three hour sermon in the morning and then another maybe hour and a half to two hours in the evening. So you imagine I'm gonna talk here for an hour and 15 minutes and in these warm comfy chairs in this dark room, you're probably already struggling <laughs> to keep up. But these, these folks would spend all day Sunday listening to about four hours of sermons. That was the day that was set apart, right? And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about Increase Mather who invents this genre called the Jeremiah and his first Jeremiah is about sleeping during his sermons. Right? He's really mad that everyone keeps sleeping during his sermons. And he views it as a mark of the decline of the true church. Um, they also sought to reform worship, right? So preaching, they sought to preach in what they called a plain style, which was about conveying information more than ritual aesthetics. Uh, music as well. The first book published in what's now the United States, published in Massachusetts Bay in 1640, was the Bay Psalm Book. It's a, just a collection of psalms um, without notation. So they're not hymns. Puritans did not sing hymns. They saw hymns as human invention, as a deviation from the early church. Uh, what we should do is just sing psalms with no instruments, a cappella. Uh, because why? Well, the New Testament never mentions instruments. <laughs> So since the New Testament never mentions hymns, never mentions instruments, we do as the New Testament lays out, right? We, the, that's what it takes to restore the early church. Extemporary prayers, meaning praying uh, just as the Spirit leads you, as, as whatever comes to mind, rather than formal prayers that followed a liturgy or followed, you know, for, the, for Anglicans at the time, the Book of Common Prayer, which would have guided them to pray certain prayers at certain times on certain days. They want to cleanse the calendar of that and have uh, extemporary prayers, no set prayers, no liturgy. So any questions about this idea of primitivism? Because that's where you're going to take us through the rest of this lecture, this idea of restoring the primitive. Yeah. Right, so if there's no liturgy, how do they deal with um, the communion and the Last Supper. Well, they celebrate it regularly. Uh, they, they view it as what you just said, actually, that phrase, do this in remembrance of me. They view it as a memorial act, an act that looks back, again, that recovers, that uh, brings to memory the Lord's uh, last dinner, Jesus' last dinner with his disciples. That's the Lord's Supper, right? They would use, that sort of phrase evokes it, do this in remembrance of me, evokes it. In rejection of the idea of the Catholic Mass, right? And the Catholic Mass is not just remembering, right? Those of you who come from Catholic backgrounds or, or you know, are aware of it, it's not just an act of remembrance. It's not just an act of going back to an earlier time. It's an act in which the body and blood of Christ are made present in the table, in the Mesa, the Mass, right? Uh, and this is an idea called transubstantiation, right? The idea that the bread and wine actually become, in their substance, not in their accidents, but in their substance, in their essence, they become the body and blood of Christ. Now this is a little bit, Joanna probably uh, remembers me going off on this a bit. Um, Puritans actually coined this term hocus pocus. Have you ever heard that term hocus pocus? Uh, they use that prominently and it's actually an anti-Catholic term. Uh, you know, what do you think of when you think of hocus pocus? What does that mean to you just out of, you know, someone uses it? Magician, magic. Witchcraft, right? Superstition. Uh, it's actually a sort of uh, crunching together of the phrase hoc est corpus meum. The Latin phrase hoc est corpus meum. Any Latin experts here? Hoc this est is corpus body meum, my. This is my body. 
right? Which would be what a priest would pronounce in a Catholic Mass in the moment in which the bread and wine are being transformed into the body and blood of Christ. He would pronounce hocus corpus meum, this is my body, this is my blood, right? Do this in remembrance of me. Puritans take the do this in remembrance of me. They dispense with the this is my body and my blood because they see it as hocus pocus. They see it as superstitious, that, that these things are not actually changing in the moment. But that's part of this wider program of primitivism, of restoring the early church. As I say, leapfrogging history. What, what was wrong with history for the Puritan perspective? It's everything that happened from Constantine to Martin Luther, <laughs> right? And even some bad things with Martin Luther as well. You know, they would critique him as well because he actually believed in hocus corpus meum, famously. He believed in some sort of spiritual presence of Christ in um, the Eucharist. But they're trying to get back to sort of leapfrog history and get back to what they believe is an early church untainted by human innovation. They do this with architecture as well. Uh, you see here pictured a Puritan meeting house in early 17th century uh, England in the top left corner. You contrast that to uh, the Canterbury Cathedral in Kent, England, built around 1174, which primarily, it was Catholic, of course, 1174, pre-Reformation, built as a Catholic cathedral and through, throughout sort of the ups and downs of the English Reformation remains Catholic, right? It has images, has saints, has images of the saints, has incense. The Puritans want to purify the church of what they called smells and bells, right? Not just hocus pocus, but incense, the bell that's rung during transubstantiation. They want to purify it, and then you would see something much more like what you see on the left, this picture of Old Ship Meeting House in Hingham, Massachusetts, one of the oldest churches we have in the U.S., which is very simple, right? Very austere, no saints, no bells, no altar. What do you see at the center of that? Just a pulpit, right? Why? Because for Puritans, what does it mean to restore this earlier time? It means preaching. It's not, it's not um, any sort of ritual. It's not any sort of sacrament. It's the pre plain style preaching. That should be the center of a service rather than the Eucharist, rather than um, the, the moment of transubstantiation. So you don't put an altar at the center, you put the pulpit at the center. And this dramatically shapes American religion, right? American uh, religion being pretty much dominated in those early years by Puritans or adjacent um, uh, Protestant Christians who, who come to the U.S. in part to escape persecution from uh, bishops and monarchy in England. But it, it trickles down throughout the much wider Protestant culture. So just to tell you a little bit about myself biographically, my people really go back to East Texas. I was just back in Nacogdoches, Texas uh, a few weeks ago uh, at the oldest uh, Baptist church in Texas, Old North Baptist Church in Nacogdoches, Texas, um, in part to do something I hadn't been able to do since the before times, right, was to see my mother was buried there, to, so to, to be able to go to her gravesite for the first time in a year and a half. And uh, those, those, uh, th those ancestors that came from Hickory Flat, Alabama in the 1840s to settle in East Texas were primitive Baptists. And here we see, this is a primitive Baptist church from North Carolina, uh, Beargrass, North Carolina, Beargrass Primitive Baptist Church. We see the effects of a really strong example of this, this idea of primitivism, right? and primitive Baptists uh, are marked themselves by a strong adherence to the, this idea that the early church uh, was simple in all its forms. You see it architecturally, of course, a very simple um, wooden structure, very much like what you would see from Puritan structures. But they're also, uh, the primitive Baptists in particular, come up in resistance to what they called, or what the wider groups called missionary Baptists. Ba Baptists who believed in cooperation between different churches to support missionaries or to support traveling evangelists. The missionary Baptists ultimately become, in one form, what we know of as the Southern Baptist Church today, Southern Baptist Convention, uh, inherit this notion of cooperation for the purpose of missions. Primitive Baptists reject that. Why? Because they see it as one step in the slippery decline towards popery. <laughs> as soon as you surrender any local autonomy, as soon as the local church gives up any control to any wider body or entity or convention, or worse, a denomination, you have 
you've taken a step towards human invention. You've taken a step away from the primitive church, the early church. Now, I, did, I brought this up with my grandmother when I was researching some of these um, ancestors. And I said, did you know, because she's Southern Baptist, I said, did you know that they're primitive Baptists? They weren't Southern Baptists. And she said, oh, you mean the old foot-washing Baptists? <laughs> and I was like, ah, I don't know about that. And then I went back to the library the next day and saw that this ancestor, Holloway Power, in the 1850s wrote a treatise on why foot washing was the third ordinance of the church. Communion, baptism, and foot washing for the primitive church are the three ordinances, the three commands of Jesus for the church. But anyway, you see, so to kind of move beyond the Puritans, you see how this idea of primitivism suffuses other ideas. And just to move it beyond Christianity a bit, I think, we can see uh, aspects of pr primitivism in uh, Jewish practice. So, for example, um, so some of the early arrivals of, of, of Jews to the Americas were first in Latin America. A lot of those Jews, because of the Spanish Inquisition and Portuguese Inquisition, made their way eventually to ports in what's now the U.S., to Savannah, Georgia, Newport, Rhode Island, Philadelphia, most prominently or near to us, Charleston, South Carolina, as early as 1695, you have uh, Sephardic Jews, Jews from Iberia, who have made their way from, mostly from Latin America, to Charleston, and found uh, the Kahol Kadosh Beth Elohim Synagogue in 1749, one of the oldest synagogues in the United States. But this synagogue itself goes through a transformation in the 19th century, and it really marks what's, what comes to be called the Reform Movement in Judaism, Reform Judaism. Uh, and one of the things that they stress, and you get it in, in the society that's created in Kahot Kodosh, uh, Beth Elohim in Charleston, the Reform Society of Israelites for promoting true principles of Judaism according to its purity and spirit. And hopefully now you've been primed to see this. Trueness, purity, spirit. This idea of stripping away the accidental, the innovated, the, the uh, invented, that which is human and material, and getting back to some kind of purity, some kind of early form. Uh, and they do this architecturally as well. For them, it meant a sort of embrace of Americanism, an embrace of a Greek revival style, family seating, male and female mixed gendered seating, the use of an organ, even a pulpit at the center of the church. So for them, it actually meant what it meant to restore pure um, uh, Judaism or a sort of uh, uh, Judaism that represented uh, a spirit that was not encumbered by history uh, was actually, in many ways, uh, linked to being American, using English, uh, again, uh, having mixed gendered seating, uh, having a pulpit, uh, and that became a way of modeling uh, true principles or a purified form of Judaism. Purified of what? Again, what had been invented along the way, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, in their case, what came to be called orthodoxy, right? And so some of the rules around uh, diet and dress and the regulation of time that characterize orthodox Judaism. We get a sense of this in the platform of, of the Reform um, Jewish movement uh, called the Pittsburgh Platform, uh, drafted in 1885, which says that we hold that all such mosaic and rabbinical laws as regulate diet, priestly purity, and dress originated in ages and under the influence of ideas entirely foreign to our present mental and spiritual state. They fail to impress the modern Jew with a spirit of priestly holiness. Their observance in our day is apt rather to obstruct than to further modern spiritual elevation. This emphasis on the spiritual state recovering a true spiritual form, and sort of a rejection of what's seen of as, as extra, as sort of invented over time, right? As they say, um, originating in ages and under the influence of ideas that are other or foreign, right? Again, here, this is a complicated text because it's also about demonstrating Americanness, demonstrating sort of progress and modernity, so it's not strictly backward looking but it is about stripping away and recovering something that they view that is, in essence, that is true while other forms had, had sort of accrued around it. We see this in Pentecostalism as well. Here's a picture of William Seymour, um, Jenny Seymour, and other early followers of Pentecostalism who gathered in Los Angeles in 1906 near Azusa Street. 
and began to argue that the marker of the true church was um, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit as evidence through speaking in tongues, right? And this happens first in a cottage at Bonnie Bray Street in Los Angeles, and then eventually at this larger warehouse, the Apostolic Faith Gospel Mission on Azusa Street, where large groups of people, black and white, old and young, began to speak in tongues. And not only speak in tongues, but experience healing, uh, the gift of healing, the gift of being able to hear people speaking in other languages and interpret that, uh, the gift of prophecy about the future. And they call this the apostolic faith, right? And here it is on the apostolic faith mission. Uh, but here it is in their newspaper as well, the apostolic faith. Uh, Pentecost has come. Los Angeles being visited by revival of Bible salvation, and Pentecost as recorded in the book of Acts. And what are they arguing? They're arguing that this thing that happened in 33 CE has happened again in 1906 on Azusa Street in Los Angeles. Pentecost has been renewed. It has been recovered. It has returned, just as it was recorded in the book of Acts, so too, in 1906. And Pentecostalism, there it is in the name, right? Pentecost, this... Um, what had been a, a, a Jewish marker of time, a Jewish celebration that marked for them the beginning of the Christian church and the time to which they hope to return. They hope to return to the Pentecost. And being Pentecostals, they would be marked by the same things that the ap apostles, right, that, that apostolic faith. So it's another example, I think, very strong example of primitivism, belief that they had returned to and recovered an earlier time. So let me talk a, a bit more about this idea of uh, recovery and then reform. And we'll return a bit to uh, the Puritans, but, but, but bring that forward to think about uh, politics and to think about one of the recurrent um, ways in which religious ideas weave their way into public discourse, particularly this language of a city on a hill. And had we time and world enough, I would ask you all to uh, think about where you have seen that and, uh, but I, I have it sort of modeled here, right, with Ronald Reagan and, and John F. Kennedy and John Winthrop, um, this idea of a shining city, right? And Ronald Reagan, in his farewell speech in 1989, returns to this idea that had been invoked by John Winthrop, which himself was quoting the Gospel book of Matthew of a, of a shining city on a hill, right? And Reagan, and, uh, sort of analyzing his own presidency in America in that moment, um, asks, uh, where stands this shining city, right, on this winter night? After 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true to the granite ridge, and her glow has held no matter what storm, and she's still a beacon, still a magnet for all who must have freedom, or for the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness towards home. Uh, John F. Kennedy, I won't read his whole quote, also evoked this uh, just before he took up the presidency, uh, and he, he points to his connection to Massachusetts uh, and the way in which being in Massachusetts, he saw himself as carrying on uh, the vision of the Puritans and the uh, speech that John Winthrop had given aboard the flagship Arbella and says that in 1961, they're recovering or they're still living in the vision of what the Puritans had laid out in 1630, right? That there was a way in which his presidency would model or sort of recover an ethos from uh, the 1630s. In this case, what is that ethos? A trust in each other, an ability to sort of live together despite differences, and to have a sort of competent commonwealth, a competent uh, form of government that uh, would express charity, would express love uh, in the way that John Winthrop had argued for it in terms of Massachusetts Bay. Uh, I guess the, the one idea I want to, I'm looking here at the time here and noticing we've got about 15 minutes, so I, I, I want to just kind of maybe wrap up with a concluding idea here and then uh, open up for question and answer. But the, one of the ideas that lies behind that idea of the city on a hill is the idea of a national covenant. Uh, and it, it, it runs through uh, Winthrop's earlier model Christian charity speech. It's taken up, I think, by Kennedy and by Reagan. And then I gave you all a couple things to read about Obama and then also about Trump uh, and ways in which they do or do not participate in this idea of us having a national covenant. Uh, and I, I guess the way I would want to connect that longer thread, 
from Winthrop and his idea of the city on a hill, uh, in which he suggested that the Massachusetts Bay was engaged in a covenant relationship with God, and to the extent that they obeyed the stipulations, they would be blessed, to the extent that they disobeyed, they would be cursed, is that it participates in this primitive idea, it participates in this looking back idea for the Puritans in terms of looking back to Israel as their model and seeing themselves as a new Israel, one in which they had a special relationship with God. Uh, later on, in, in the forms that we mentioned here briefly with Kennedy and Reagan, you get this idea of, as America and later Obama, maybe too, if we want to talk about that in terms of that reading, uh, as participating in a sort of covenant relationship with something greater, if not God, with uh, a, a sort of divine, divinely sanctioned role in the world to spread democracy, to spread freedom, to spread liberty. And the extent to which we lived up to that promise, we would be blessed, and to the extent in which we didn't, we might be cursed. Now, the, I'll just introduce this phrase, and then I, then I want to stop so we can have time for question and answers. Uh, the reading suggests that this is, uh, this is l a return to an idea that goes back to Israel of a so-called Jeremiah, a Jeremiah, a prophetic figure that is calling a nation to return, to recover some kind of past mission, and, and in so doing, maybe realize that they're present, uh, they, in the present they have declined and degraded and are not, in, uh, not living up to what they should be. Um, let me stop it there, because I think um, I, I want to open up to, to more question and answers that might be coming in, and then um, maybe be able to tease out that idea of the Jeremiah or the Jeremiah in relationship to those questions. Okay, I'm going to raise some questions that have come in over the uh, and I'm going to ask you to repeat them. I don't know. Can people hear these phone calls? I say them. <laughs> that is a, okay, so to repeat that, you know, given God's omniscience, that God knows everything isn't everything already predetermined and a playing out of what's already known in the mind of God. That is a belief. Uh, it's a belief that uh, when I was in seminary, people argued over relentlessly, right? In a way, it expresses this debate between uh, predestination, right? The idea that uh, God, because God is omnipresent everywhere, omnipotent, has all power, and omniscient, knows everything, then certainly everything must be predestined or predetermined. And others that suggest, no, 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 God has, may, might have all those things, but has opened up space for human agency, for free will, right? And that's not, I'm not really, despite having degrees in theology, I'm myself, I'm not a theologian, I'm uh, a historian, so I wouldn't be equipped to answer whether that's true or false, um, but, but could contextualize it and say that that's been a sort of push and pull not just obviously in Christian discourse, but I think it's an idea that uh, in other religious uh, worlds. Oh, right, for sure. So, yeah, to get back to connect it directly to the premillennial ideas, yes, they believe that that has been set in the foundations of time. And it's there in the Bible. All we need to do is, is read Daniel appropriately, read Ezekiel appropriately, read Matthew and Revelation appropriately, and we'll know what God's plan is. So this idea of biblical prophecy, you can, why can you predict things? Because, yes, God's already predetermined what will happen. So I wouldn't say it appears in all religions. I mean, I think this is something that in religious studies we were very hesitant to make universal claims, right? Because everything uh, really is about the ways in which things happen in their particulars and the local. I'm sorry to just repeat what you said for those here. Uh, the question is, is this idea of return 
present in Islam in similar ways that it's present in Christianity and is it present in all religions? I, I wouldn't dare to say whether it's present in all religions. Um, although I think it's a human impulse, right? And I think we'll continue to see it come up in our conversation. So it would be, it, it would be surprising to me if, if we found some sort of practice or iteration that doesn't have some sort of idea of return to it. Um, Islam is, again, tricky because we're talking about um, 14, 1,500 years uh, of, of history and what group are you talking about at what time. But certainly, yeah, this idea, particularly if they're referencing like Islamicist ideas uh, of the 20th century, of ret returning and restoring some sort of purity that had been lost. Uh, and, and, and as we've seen that, right, work its way out into movements like um, ISIS, you know, more recently in the last decade, of an idea of, of a sort of radical purification program based on some sort of restoration, in their case, of the Islamic State, right, a pure time, a strong time. So I do think, I mean, it's, it's different in its details, but yes, there, this idea of returning and then that being a program for reform or reimagining our present or our future is, is common in other groups. Yeah, well, I think that's mostly true. Well, it is true, but it can, new foundings can happen. One example I didn't get to, probably one of the most well-known in terms of talking about restoration, would be the Latter-day Saints, right? The Mormon church sees itself as restoring the true church of Jesus Christ in the latter days, but it's an act of return, right? Uh, and an act of restoration, but through, for them, through new revelation, or through revelation that's been recovered in the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants. Um, so they actually posit that there had been a corruption very early on, right? That the New Testament itself is so thoroughly corrupted that, it, that you need, there needs to be further revelation, a new founding, a new origin. Yes. So what happened to the Oh, like what did what happened to the Puritans historically? I mean, did they morph into other religious beliefs? Right. Anyone here go to the United Church of Chapel Hill? You know that church? Uh, the you know the um, the Churches of Christ, the um, United Churches of Christ are kind of a descendant organization of the Puritans, as well as if you go to the Unitarian Universalist congregation here in town or, or in Durham, Eno River, um, though they're a descendant uh, through a, a lot of changes over time. Uh, Harvard University, where I went, Harvard Divinity School, founded by the Puritans, ultimately becomes Unitarian Universalist. Um, so there are, there are multiple kind of descendant, direct descendant organizations, mostly the United Churches of Christ and the Unitarian Universalist, which is, you know, interesting because we would characterize them as being on the left of our political spectrum, right? Uh, our sort of social, on social issues today. Uh, and so probably somewhat surprising that they're actually the descendants of the Puritans. But other groups, uh, probably the Primitive Baptists, my, uh, my ancestors who I talked about, would see themselves as the rightful inheritors of the Puritan tradition for the way in which they reiterate the primitive uh, worship style. Church, the Churches of Christ and Christian churches, particularly the a cappella Churches of Christ, if you're familiar with, with that group, uh, very much participate. It's another group I didn't get to quite. See themselves as a restorationist group, mu very much in line with that Puritan program, uh, following a strict prescription of what the New Testament lays out in terms of worship. So, I mean, there are direct descendants, um, but we would see them as somewhat askance in some ways from, um, from the more conservative elements of Puritanism, although I would say we don't always appreciate to go back to John Winthrop and the model of Christian charity. You read that closely and you might think you're reading critical race theory <laughs> or critical theory. I mean, it's, it's, it's about shared common life and abridging differences and addressing injustices and uh, practicing Christian charity in a pretty radical way, actually. Uh, so in some sense, what we think of as Puritans as being conservative um, is not quite true. I think there are legacies that they have that Really, very much uh, would correspond to progressive politics today. I'm going to try another question. I think my mic is now on so that people at home can hear. Uh, this is from Katie Williams about the idea of a national covenant. 
whether a secular religion in America that looks back to the very beginning, the kind of founding fathers, is the same idea that we must return to the virtue of the founders. Right, thank you. So the question is whether a sort of there's a secular idea of returning to the Constitution or returning to 1776 or some sort of age of Original the Original intention, that sort of thing. You're right, yeah. as, as, as a primordial age that should, and of course, yeah, I think that's a great insight. It's part of why in the preliminary readings, I had those two readings about Obama and then also a counter reading that said, well, no, actually MAGA is the greatest <laughs> example of this today. Make America great again, what does that mean? That means there's some sort of age that was passed that was the great age and we need to return to that, recover it, and pull it forward, right? Uh, but, you know, the, I think we, we can read this in the speeches of Martin Luther King Jr. I think we can read it in, in the way in which Obama stood and, at Liberty Hall in front of a copy of the Constitution and said, we've lost something as America, and we need to get back to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are numerous examples of these, and this is what, you know, I was just gesturing towards at the end, we call Jeremiah's. Mm -hmm. or the politician as someone who is a Jeremiah prophetic figure who's saying we have slipped away, we've declined from our national covenant, let us return, let us recover and return to that. So no, it definitely, I think it does pervade so-called secular di discourse, although religious studies scholars challenge this secular religion, this divide for obvious reasons, right? How secular is it when we, we see that in the words of Tracy Fessenden, this is just Protestantism in disguise, mm -hmm. right? Or it's, where we've inherited some of the same histories and we've called them and maybe we use the word democracy uh, today or, or liberty today, but they are, they are an impulse towards recovering uh, a mission in the world, an exceptional mission in the world. Another question here if there's not one from the room right now. Um, th this has to do with the two themes of American culture, the idea of progress, that things are getting better every year. We have a traditional idea of progress and versus the idea of returning to a better past. Would this be a way to describe the basic tension in American culture between those who always think things are getting worse, it was better in the past, and those who believe that they're always getting better? And is there a millennial explanation for both of those points of views? Right, that's a, that's a fascinating point. It's, a, it's an argument that I'm prone to make myself. If I had more time, I would actually tease out some differences in the Puritans between those who settled Massachusetts Bay, who are like more strictly Puritans because they stayed in the Church of England and wanted to purify the Church of England, and those that called themselves separatists who founded Plymouth, right? And we think of Plymouth Rock, They're actually kind of a separate group, and they separated from the Church of England because they believed that it was beyond hope. Right? They believed it was in such steep decline and so thoroughly tainted with popism that they couldn't possibly purify it. So what do you do? You need to separate. And some of the more radical forms of that, people like Roger Williams, who founds uh, the uh, Providence Colony, uh, Providence Plantation, uh, he actually becomes so thoroughly disenchanted with the idea of purifying the church or a progress, to use that term, that uh, he believes the true church had disappeared completely from Earth becomes what we call a seeker. He's actually waiting for new apostles to come and a new Pentecost to come, almost like a Pentecostal, right, to reestablish something new because things had gotten so bad. Or in the dispensational idea, or premillennial idea of, you know, things had gotten so bad, uh, as D.L. Moody, famous dispensationalist, a preacher out of Chicago said, uh, Moody, the world has gone to hell, uh, and it's under a great flood, and I've given you a lifeboat, right? So what's our role? to do what Billy Graham did, just save people out of this world that's already condemned and not try to affect uh, you know, wider social change, right? And I do think that's a tension from the example of Billy Graham and D.L. Moody, but going back to the Puritans and separatists of those who kind of stay in and want to work for reform and lay out a vision of a model of Christian charity, a society that can model true Christianity and be at peace, or one that says, eh, actually, <laughs> Uh, no, we're just going to preserve the church, right, mm -hmm. and the purity of the church because uh, society can't be reformed. We, there is no progress that can be affected. I, I have one more, one more question here um, about the Reformed Judaism and whether the anti-ritualism of Reformed Judaism is uniquely American. Isn't there also a return to prophetic Judaism in places like Germany where a Abraham Geiger in the 19... 1830s uh, was already making the same kind of argument. Yeah, for sure. I did mean to 
I suggest, uh, I'll repeat that for those who, who might not have heard it. The, the question is whether in Reformed Judaism is that uniquely American or whether there weren't precedents in other places, in particular Germany. That's absolutely correct. That in, in many ways those impulses began in Germany and people like Isaac Mayer Weiss, who, who's seen as one of the founders of Reformed Judaism in the United States and um, the movement that's created in Cincinnati uh, a, to build up uh, Reform Judaism is in many ways connected to and inspired by events in the 1830s in Germany. So that's, that's definitely correct. Um, you know, this is kind of the nature of, of, of one of these things is I'm going over things quickly yeah, uh, sure. to describe it, but it's not unique to the, to, to the United States. Although the example I gave you from Charleston and then later with the Pittsburgh platform, there are some unique elements to it, the way in which they embrace English and so-called modernity and model themselves after Protestant American forms, seeing that as a purified form. So do most religions have a belief that the end of time is coming, or is that somewhat unique to the kind of Christianity you described? Ooh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to, again, I'm, I'm going to like back away from ever saying most or all. Um, I think we've certainly seen examples of, you know, to, to talk about Judaism, right? I went to college um, at Columbia University in the uh, 90s, and at that time, the Lubavitcher Jews of, uh, of Crown Heights were the uh, Rebbe Menachem Schneerson was still alive, and he was saying Mashiach is coming. And everywhere you went uh, on the subways or uh, streets of New York, you would see pictures of Menachem Schneerson, the Rebbe, saying Mashiach is coming, and he just so happened to fulfill some of those qualities too. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of an expectation that there would be, an, uh, not, in this case, not a return, right? But the arrival of Mashiach, of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's certainly examples in other groups, uh, sort of prophetic Mekdi figures in Islam. Um, to go back to the Mashiach, the Aztec that we talked about, there's you know, some contestation over this, but there has been a an, an, uh, long going argument that they were in the midst of a return moment in their 52-year cycle, and it, they were expecting the return of Quetzalcoatl to inaugurate a new age, and that when Cortez came, that he was read as, a, as Quetzalcoatl, as mm -hmm. a sort of defined figure, and that maybe had uh, opened them up to, to conquest, ultimately. So, yeah, and we certainly see other examples of, if not an, like a radical, progressive eschatology or end-time scenario, some sort of uh, major moment of turning of things, right, uh, in which time is going to be very different. Well, thank, thank you very much, Brandon. We're going we're gonna to take a break now and reconvene at about 11 o'clock. Those in the room can go out and have a coffee. Those at home, go get your coffee on your own, and we'll see you soon. Thank you so thank much. You we've, we've run out of time. <laughs> it's a good thing. <laughs>